Oh, hello. Welcome. We're not starting yet, but... Hello. Is it coming through fine? Testing? Okay. to Covenant Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you guys are all able to be here this morning. We have a small group. It's, it's August. School's about ready to start, so people are uh, taking as many vacations as they can right now. Uh, but we're so glad that you're all here this morning, and we're so glad that you're watching online uh, either now or uh, maybe in the next coming days on YouTube. So we're just excited that you're all here with us. Um, we have a couple announcements. Um, first of all, as you know, I'm most of you know I'm Josh Fowler, the youth director here at Covenant, but the pastors are still on vacation, and they'll, they'll be gone next weekend as well, um, and Tom Anders will be preaching for us. And the, also the exciting thing is Tom Anders is not only, he's doing all the pastoral duties this week, he's the pastor on call, the elder on call um, for the pastors, and he's preaching next week. So if anybody has any, any questions or any, anything they need to reach out to or just want to bother Tom, uh, his number's in the bulletin, so you guys can look that up and give him a call. Maybe just, just, just call and then hang up. Uh, just, just, just give him a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other, only other announcement we have, it's the one we've been doing for a while, but uh, it's just that the mission trip to New Bern, North Carolina is coming up soon in o October, so if you would still like to go on that, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, you can let me know, or you can more importantly let Tom Anders know, or uh, Peter Decker, or uh, Knox uh, when he gets back from vacation. Um, we just again want to welcome you all though, and uh, so grateful that you're all here and you're all watching online. Um, will the Lord be with you? Now is the time for our call to worship. If you'd like to stand for our call to worship, if, if you're able, you can please stand. Come, Holy Spirit, come.
be the wind and the fire that transforms our lives as we study your word of life. Kindle faith from our believing doubt. Cleanse us from our waywardness. Deepen our passion for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give us voice to proclaim your mighty words in every tongue. Fill your church with power. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. And now we're going to have uh, our praise songs. Uh, you can remain standing for that. Connor isn't able to be with us this morning. Uh, he wasn't feeling well. Um, so we're going to have uh, uh, music, but it's, it may not, it's not going to be the songs that are in our bulletin. So please join along with us on the screen. You may be seated. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and now is the time uh, for our prayer of confession. The Bible says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth does not reside within us. But if we confess our sins, then God is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God and then in silence. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Hear this good news. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfastness. Love, his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. Amen. Now is the time for our silent music. Um, we'll enjoy <laughs> Ashley's beautiful playing.
Thank you, Ashley. That was amazing. It is well with my soul, but way better than I've ever heard it done before. So that was awesome. Don't tell Connor, but man, we were blessed um, with the change of plans. Uh, we're going to see that today uh, when we look at Exodus. Um, blessings come through unexpected hardships. And we're bummer that we're missing out on Connor, but man, we were blessed this morning with that. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so today, uh, we're going to talk about Exodus 1. Uh, but before we do that, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here today to worship you. We pray that you open our hearts and minds this morning to hear your will for our lives. Allow us today to look back at the history of your people to give us guidance on how we are called to worship and follow you. We pray that these words urge us to live lives that look more and more like the ones that you are calling us to live. Amen. So today, like I said, we get to start a new sermon series on the book of Exodus. Pastors Bevan Knox chose this book uh, a long time ago, um, and it would be coming right after our sermon series on Philippians. Um, and they also, I don't know if they realized, but they were like, oh, we're going to be on vacation for the beginning of Exodus, so good luck, guys. Um, for Tom and I. Uh, so I get to kick us, kick us off with the introduction of Exodus and then chapter 1, and Tom Andrus will teach us about chapter 2 next week, um, and then Bevan Knox will come back after that and tell you where we went wrong and uh, fix us, fix everything, and then uh, we'll jump right back, continue on in, Ex in Exodus. I think we're going to be going over the book of Exodus up until Advent or Christmas time, um, which seems like a really long time. Um, but it took the Israelites 40 years to get out of the desert. So in comparison, we're pretty lucky. So I, I'm pretty excited about uh, hearing about the rest of Exodus from our pastors when they return. So the exciting book of Exodus. Some of you listening may hear Exodus and think, oh yeah, that's right. I like it. 
there's the burning bush. Um, that's pretty cool. Then there are all those plagues, and those are really nasty and maybe not so cool. Uh, then there's the parting of the Red Sea, and the Israelite people go through that. There's the Ten Commandments. And then after that, I don't really know. The second half of the book gets, gets pretty boring. But yeah, I remember some of those stories in the beginning. They're, they're pretty cool. So we're going to hear those stories, and we're going to see connections that you didn't see before, new things about God that you may not have really realized before, and ways in which this book unfolds that you haven't thought of before. But today, we are looking at the beginning. And since we are just starting the book of Exodus, it's important to get a little background on the book. But before we even start that, it is important to note that whenever we read and study the Old Testament, it's always wise to interpret it, the meaning of scriptures, from the view that Jesus is the final word in the story of God's plan. I also want to note that Exodus is the second book in the Bible. And while I know most of you know that, I think it's still important for us all to hear it again and to remember that. And after knowing that, we can examine who the author of this book is and whom they are speaking to. The easy answer to the question of authorship of the book is to say that Moses wrote Exodus and actually the rest of the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of our Bible. This is the easy way because that has basically been uh, the widely held belief and lore passed down through generations. But this has been highly disputed for at least 300 years and even well before that. And nowhere in this book does it say that Moses saw the writer, uh, uh, was the writer of the book or all of those books. There are instances in those, these books where God told Moses to write down an instance with the Amalekites, Amalekites I can't even say it, uh, in Exodus 17. And there, then in other books, when writing about the law of God, he's told to write those down. But to say he wrote it all is a little far-fetched, especially when he would have to write things like this and a line about himself in the book of Numbers that says, I am more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Uh, and that would be a hard line to write about yourself. He would also have had to write the account of his own death in Deuteronomy, which also seems like a tall task to do. The best attitude to have about the authorship of Exodus and the rest of the Pentateuch um, is a humble open-mindedness. We know these stories came from Moses, um, but we don't know how they all came together. So then we have a similar problem with the question of who is the author writing to? We know that the author is writing to Israelite people, but it may be more helpful to understand the initial composition of Exodus probably came about as a product of the Babylonian exile around the 6th century BCE, which we know based on earlier written and oral traditions, which is 600 years after the Exodus from Egypt. So quite a while, a lot has passed. And Peter Inns in the New NIV application commentary makes a good point when studying any book in the Bible, and I wanted to relay that to you. The point to be made is simply that the question of authorship of any biblical book, precisely because it is God's word, must go beyond merely the question of human authorship, um, their historical setting, and the setting of their audience. Scrip scripture ultimately reaches beyond its own time and place, for it is a book that ult ultimately comes from God. The fact that all scripture, scripture has not only a human author, but a divine author, is vital to any investigation of a text's meaning. And I thought that's important for us to think about when we read the Bible. And finally, before we dive into the passage for today, I want to understand the name in the book of Exodus. We get the name Exodus from the Greek translation of the original Hebrew writing. But that's not the name of the book in the Hebrew Bible. As, we often, as was often the case in the ancient world, the Hebrew Old Testament named the books after the first few words in them. So, in Hebrew, this book is literally called, These Are the Names. Um, because that's the first words in the book. It's not as catchy as Exodus, but that's what it's called. It made sense and it helped connect it with the names that had come before in the end of Genesis. That we're continuing the story of these people who left their promised land and came to Egypt. In addition to that, 
if you looked at the next two books in the Bible, Leviticus and then Numbers, uh, they begin their original Hebrew text with the word and. The first word of both of those books is and. Because those four, these four books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, all connect into the same saga. The original authors started book after book with and these are the names of and and. It's all part of the same story. Each book ends like the end of a season of your favorite show with a cliffhanger and then start again with a new season in the next book. So let's dive into the actual first chapter of Exodus. We're going to read all 22 verses of the first chapter um, and then look at some important points in this chapter. So we begin with Exodus chapter 1, verse 1, and we see the continuation, uh, continuation from Genesis 50, and also it's a near restatement of a passage found in Genesis 46, kind of like the recap of your TV show. In the previous episode, you get the beginning, shows you what happened in the last season or the last episode, and now it, you get caught up, you know where you're at. And it says, These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. The total number of people born to Jacob was 70. Joseph was also in, already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers and that whole generation. So we're closing out. We all remember, okay, Joseph died at the end of Genesis. That's a good, that's a good thing to remember. Now we can continue on in verse 7 with the new information that's separate from Genesis. But a continuation. And it says, but the Israelites were fruitful and prolific. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so the land was filled with them. And now a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase in the event of war, join our enemies, and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all their tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt summoned. The mid they did not do, sorry. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. And it ends. Chapter 1, just like that. We're done. Kill all the boys. That's it. All right. See you later. So in this opening chapter, we see how the Israelites, Israelites got into such a terrible situation. The book is called Exodus, because it will show us how they got out of Egypt. But if we are going to have an Exodus, we need to understand how they got into this place to begin with. So how do these people get into Egypt? How did they become slaves that they would need to be delivered through an Exodus? If we remember our Israelite history, we see Jacob's sons, and we remember Jacob is was the son of Isaac and Rebekah. 
and who was also Abraham and Sarah's grandson. So his sons joined their brother Joseph, who we also remember the brothers tried to kill because he had the coat of many colors, or a lot of us remember as the Technicolor dream coat. Um, but he forgives them. Joseph forgives them and helps save their family and all of Egypt by interpreting the Pharaoh's dreams and preparing for a famine. But now, 400 years later, Egypt's new Pharaoh, who does not remember how Joseph had saved Egypt, is fearful of the growing Israelite people. So we see here that he forces them into slavery and orders the killing of all of the newborn boys to weaken and reduce their population. I want to dive into one part of this chapter that really jumps out and leads us into the bigger themes and applications for us today. We're going to look at the two women in the passage who have been written about, written into history for the past over 3,000 years. We almost know, we almost all know about Moses, and we will begin to hear more about him next week, but I doubt most of us know the story of Shifra and Pua. And I also found it interesting uh, that we know the names of these two women, but we never get the name of Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh is this king, mighty. Um, we know about two midwives. We know their names. But it's never, mentioned, it's never mentioned Pharaoh's name during this, which I think is very interesting. And it's disputed of who the Pharaoh was at the time. So uh, we know about Shifra and Pua. And then we're seeing some pictures um, that were depicted of them through different ages. And I just thought it was kind of cool to maybe see uh, people's uh, interpretations of what they might have looked like. And the story that sets the stage for Moses to live for, because of them. And it determines the entire fate of a people. Shifra and Pua were midwives. And their primary goal is to usher in life. Regardless of status or race or any other defining division. To assist, guide, and protect life. But Pharaoh is deliberate with his newest attempt, attempt, attempt to limit the growth of the Hebrews. He knows that these midwives are the intervener between life and death. And he says, choose death. I can only imagine what these two women, Shifra and Pua, had running through in their minds at the time. I'm sure they went through a few scenarios. Either we are courageous and we say no to Pharaoh, Although when we refuse Pharaoh's orders, we will likely die, and so will our families, and probably our friends. Or we aren't courageous, and we say yes to Pharaoh. Then we follow Pharaoh's orders, and by the work of our own hands, bring the death to the next generation of the Hebrew males. Thankfully, these women, these midwives, seem to know another way. And they find courage deep within their hearts, and know they must follow and serve God. Serving God's plan helps them see beyond the fear of rebelling against the Pharaoh and allows them instead to serve life. A life following God's plan. Not only were these courageous women, they are defiant for God. They are heroes in their refusal to kill baby boys. They are clever in their explanation to Pharaoh of why baby boys keep being born. They say these Hebrew women are so strong and vigorous that they birth their babies before we can even arrive. This is courageous and it's cunning. That explanation isn't just an excuse to buy them time. It's a subversive move to up uphold the strength and dignity of the Hebrew people to Pharaoh. God's people. And not only that, Shifra and Pua were likely midwives who attended their own people's births, but also the births of their alleged enemies as well. These mi women uh, midwives were involved deeply and truly at the center of women and families' most important moments. To just go in and assist a birth is not the way of a midwife. A midwife is one who identifies with pain and hold hands with, holds hands with pain. They comfort hearts that are full of despair and people who want to give up. Day after day, 
birth after birth, they came alongside the other. These women who they should hate, and yet they take their hands, they rub their backs, and they comfort and instruct, following God's plan for life. They know that their God is one who sits alongside of them too. A God who doesn't just go to the enemy and to those on the fringes to serve someone else, but one who lives on the fringes with them. And these midwives do this as well. They live on the fringes and in their vocation take on a calling, an oath to in all ways serve life. And the courage they dip into is God's because they believe that he is truly with them and guiding them along their way. They greet pain, the pain of childbirth, the pain of injustice, and the pain of not being seen with these virtues of God. I can wonder if we wrestle with the same question in our own lives, whether deeply or subconsciously, does what I do matter? Does it bring forth anything new or courageous into our world? Does it show other people God's plan for our world? These midwives seem to encourage us that yes, wherever we are, whatever we do, whoever we talk to, it all matters. If we do it with kindness, generosity, impartiality, then we are backed by a God that is real and it all matters. So what do we do in response to this message? What can we learn from these two women and the story of God's people? First, be faithful in what you can do. You're not in control of everything. Actually, we are not in control of much. The older I get, the more I realize this biblical truth more and more, that I am not in control. God is in control. So we need to just do what we can when God places opportunities in our lives to show his love, his kindness, his joy, his mercy, and his forgiveness. Remember, the Israelites are slaves in Egypt and soon will be a generation lost in the wilderness. Sometimes it feels like we are a little lost too. Or maybe we aren't in the land that we thought we should be in. But when we are faithful and trust God's plan, his light will shine through. Sometimes we will need to take other people by the hand, rub their backs, comfort and instruct. And at other times, we'll need to le lean into trusting God and allow for others to help do that for us. Always following God's plan for life. Lastly, we need to trust that the hardest part of our, your story is not the end of God's story for us. The hardest part is not the end. Do you realize that the Israelites lived as slaves in Egypt for over 400 years? That's a lot longer than our country's even been around. That's a long time to keep believing in God's plan. A lot of us have gone through some hard times in the past year or a year and a half. You may have lost loved ones. You've had trouble at home. Maybe with your spouse or you struggled with kids or kids that were in pain. You might have had horrible moments in your job or even struggled to find work. Or maybe you have left, have felt alone and lost. It could be a number of things. It could be all of those things. If you feel like you're in the worst of times, the question I have for you is, do you believe and trust that God still has a plan for you even after all that has gone on? Shifra and Pua and the Israelites will find out that it's much more delightful to serve God than to serve Pharaoh. God isn't done getting glory through you. 
the journey to the promised land was never promised to be easy. It often involved bleak times, as these people were, who were slaves in Egypt and then wandering in the wilderness were wondering, really, God? We're not there yet? Is it ever going to happen? Yeah, it will. And you need to trust that. I need to trust that. We all need to trust that. That wherever we are in our story, now is not the end. Because God is writing the story. And God's story has a glorious end for us all. Let us pray. Our, heaven and our Father in heaven, we give thanks for the story of your people. The story of two courageous women and the promises and guidance that that gives us today. And we always give thanks for you, Jesus, who saves us, and for your spirit who restores us. We pray that by, that by the same grace with which you have saved us, you will also lead us along your plan and ultimately home with you. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Now you can all stand uh, and maybe shake it out a little bit. And we're going to sing the song or sing in our hearts the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And I'll try not to sound too horrible up here. is the time where we recite the Apostles' Creed that has been recited for hundreds and hundreds of years. Please join with me in saying it. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Now is the time for our ritual of friendship and sharing our concerns, but also our joys. Does anyone have any joys or concerns that they would like to share? Yes, Todd. said in Smith. All right, uh, for those that uh, are watching at home, uh, Todd Gossett shared that um, a family friend, Wendy Winstead, uh, passed away um, this week. So just prayers for the Winstead family, but also for the Smith family, and just um, grieving together in this time. Does anyone else have any joys or concerns that they would like to share? Uh, uh, we'll, we'll join our, uh, our, our, our ourselves together um, and pray uh, for these things and for many things around the world. So please bow your heads with me and join in prayer. As we enter into this time of prayer, O oh God, we offer our gratitude that you are always present and we thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to us to receive our prayers. Instill in us a desire to listen to others and to actually hear them. Instill in us a spirit of serenity that others might feel accepted in your non-judgmental grace. We want to pray now for the nations of this world, their leaders, and the well-being of everyone in this world, and especially Afghanistan right now. We pray for the poor and the sick, the hungry and the oppressed, the prisoners, the unemployed, and all of those in need right now. And we especially pray that all of your children can rally together to change this world into your kingdom here on earth. And we want to share just one personal concern with you, Lord, today. We pray for Wendy and that that she's with you now. Uh, We pray especially those for those that are still here on earth. We pray for the Winstead family um, and for the Smith family as they grieve the loss of Wendy. We pray that you just surround them in love and time together. And we just pray that, that just your love shines through all those that are surrounded in this time of mourning. And we pray all of these things as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time of, for our offering, which we're doing differently now, as you guys all know. Um, but if you want to give online, um, that's on your screens now. Um, or you can do it from your phones right now if you're that tech savvy. Um, but we really uh, just are so thankful and so, so glad for all of your generosity during this really hard time. Um, and all the money that you've been sending in through the mail um, or dropping the, in the collection plates, it is a blessing to not only us, but to all of those that that money serves. Um, and we're just so glad that all of these pe- people that are touched by all of your generosity. So let us at this time sing our doxology and praise to God. And you can stand for that. Or not. But join in the music.
now please join with me in saying of our prayer of dedication. O oh God, we confess that we often come to this place with questions and uncertainties instead of faith and hope. But always we come with gratitude for the gift of life and the abundance that is ours. Grant us the grace to respond to our bounty and blessings with generosity, that others might know of your love through us. Amen. Now is the time for our closing hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Please join with me in saying Covenant's memory verse for the year, 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of of God and on his, of his only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, Jesus his Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Again, we thank you for joining us this morning, and we're so glad that you're with us. Have a great week.